Welcome everyone. We're not going to start yet, but if you just want to put in the chat where you're joining us from, what country you're joining us from, what brought you to here, we'd love to, to hear from everyone who, who came to join us today. I was, I was gonna make a joke that Hoboken, New Jersey is very non-exotic to me, but we actually have a panelist, we have panelists from all over the world. So maybe Hoboken, New Jersey is exciting to some of these, <laughs> to others who are not, I'm, I'm New York based, so. Uh, just as people keep joining us, we're just asking you to put your uh, location in the chat so we get to appreciate what a wonderfully large crowd we have here um, and where everyone is coming from. And we'll get started in just a couple of moments. Uh, I'm starting to see the participant numbers staying pretty steady. Uh, so I think I'm going to get us started. Uh, it's nice to meet everyone. My name is Shuli Karkowski. I'm the Executive Vice President for Chazon, which is the largest Jewish environmental nonprofit in North America. Um, I'm really honored to be moderating this panel and, and just to have access to this incredible group of experts from various governments and academic institutions and different disciplines. Um, before we start uh, formal business, I'm going to turn it over to one of our hosts, um, Adva Vilchinsky who is the Consul for Public Diplomacy at the Consulate General of Israel in New York. Adva, thank you for hosting us. Hello, everyone. Great seeing you all and great seeing, like reading the chat, such a great idea. Thank you. Seeing people from all over the globe. And as we know, we celebrate International Earth Day. That's, that should be uh, the, the proper uh, representation. So it's great. Um, I don't want to take too much time of the people who are really the experts in the field that for to hear you, that's why everybody is joining and not to hear me. But I do want to say on the behalf of the diplomatic corps here in, the, in New York and the Israeli consulate in Israel, we are more than honored to, to push and promote this issue. This is only one we have, as you know, a series of four different um, webinars today. Uh, to discuss these important topics, but the state of Israel is not only discussing, it's, it's also doing, and I know that a lot of the other states which are represented here uh, and will speak more about what they do, like both on policy-wise uh, and also civil society. So it's great to see so many people from all over the world doing it uh, in, the different, in two different levels. Uh, here in, in the Israeli consulate in New York, we're more than happy uh, to hear more than the people here in the chat and the people uh, that registered about what we could do more uh, in our region here in New York uh, with the topics that we are experts in, either um, Israel or all other panel panelist uh, countries that are part of this webinar and of this day. We have more than 10 uh, countries promoting this day. Um, so I'm really thankful for you to join us, and I'm very uh, eager to hear everything you're going to say. So thank you very much, and happy happy International Earth Day. Adva, thank you so much for your role in bringing us all together um, and for that framing. And, and this, this conversation doesn't need much framing. Uh, for decades, we've known that nature and its brilliant diversity is declining globally 
at rates unprecedented in human history, and that the rates of the extinction are accelerating every year. Um, we know we need to do something to change this, and that that response requires something at every level, from local to global. We need transformative change that's fundamental and system-wide across technology and economies, social organizations, and public and private sector. Um, and so we are uniquely privileged to be in the presence of these experts who represent an incredible cross-section of those areas I just mentioned. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our panelists one at a time and giving them a chance to talk a little bit about themselves and their work. Um, I'm going to ask them a few questions to get the conversation started. And then near the end, we hope to take a few more questions from the chat that I'll help to moderate um, and then close with a closing thought from each of our experts. Um, and I'm delighted to start with Professor Uri Shainis, who is um, a professor at the University of Haifa and is also founder of This Is My Time, This Is My Earth, which is also called Time um, in Israel. Uh, professor Shainis, please tell us a bit about your work. Thank you. Can I share the screen, uh, Shirley? Is it possible to share the screen? I sure hope so. Try it. <laughs> yeah, let's try. No, yeah. it's disabled. Can you, can you allow it? Uh, I don't know who's running tech. Miriam, do you think you can help us with that? Yes, you have it, Doctor. You can do it now. Okay, great. Yeah, hi. So, hi, everyone, and happy Earth Day. And yeah, my name is Roy Shainis. I'm from the Biology and Environment uh, Department at the University of Haifa and Oanim, and also, the, as they said, the CEO of Time. So I think the two greatest challenge of humanity today is cli our climate change and, and the species extinction. And it's just unbelievable that every second we lose a forest, the area, the size of a football field. It, it's almost unimaginable. And in fact, we are now in, uh, scientists talk about that we are entering now a six mass extinction that is all uh, our fault or our, uh, our deed. And in the last 50 years, we lost more than 50. This is says 50, but it's more than 60% of the animal population just in the last, uh, the last uh, uh, 50 years. And I've been teaching that and uh, providing my students both the uh, knowledge and the awareness uh, of, of these numbers. But at, at a certain point, I, I ask myself, is there anything uh, that I personally can do about it? Not only teach about it, not only preach about it, not only uh, provide information of the destruction, but can I do something uh, very personally that maybe if I can do it, everyone will be able to do it. So I started, so the first thing that I wanted to do was uh, to uh, tackle the, uh, the, main, the, main, uh, uh, the, the main factor that caused a, a species extinction. This is habitat destruction. And of course I would, <clears throat> would have liked to just go, you know, and hug all the trees and hug all these places around the world and not letting them uh, go and maybe making them uh, or turning them into conservation areas. But this is of course uh, not uh, realistic. So, so I thought maybe we should start with a biodiversity hotspot. Biodiversity hotspots are places, uh, biogeographic regions that are both significant reservoir of biodiversity and they are threatened with destruction. And they only amount to just two 0.3% of the land surface of the planet. So maybe this is the place where we should put our uh, effort. And then I learned something very interesting. I learned that 50% of the hotspots around the world are in private ownership. So maybe we can go and purchase them. Maybe we can buy them. Of course, I cannot do it myself, but maybe if we organize the citizens of the world, we can go and purchase this land. And this led me to, uh, to establish a, a new organization, uh, which we call TIME, or it's an acronym for This Is My Earth. And the idea of TIME is to go and purchase those biodiversity uh, uh, lands and, uh, uh, to, uh, and to preserve them for future generations. And we wanted to do it in a unique, in a unique way. 
we wanted to uh, let actually every person in the world in the planet to help reduce habitat destruction by by indeed by purchasing this land in these biodiversity hotspots and allow them to join a democratic and interactive and educating organization. How do we do that? So the first thing we said, we're gonna make it affordable. Every person in the world can join time with only $1 a year. And not only that they can pay only $1, we, we, we say and we provide them the ability that these 100% of their donations, whether it's a dollar or more, will go to land purchasing. And that means that we are very transparent, we are reliable, we take no overhead, which means we are totally relying on volunteers. But not only that, we also said that by joining time, you have a democratic vote. You can vote on our website where you want us to go and purchase the land. And the votes are all equal. So whether you, whether you donated a dollar or you donated $10,000, you have one vote per year. So every kid in the world, every person in the world, whether rich or poor, can join time and can participate in this democratic, uh, uh, democratic voting for these lands. Um, so to enable to do that, we form a scientific advisory committee that, uh, uh, that screen all the applications that, uh, of organization around the world that want, us, uh, want our help to purchase land. And we have uh, really top scientists from all over the world, from every continent. We also have a board, international board of, uh, uh, of governors uh, from all over the world. And they're all volunteers. And of course, lots of volunteers from all over the world. This is how we do it. For example, today, if you go to Time Now, to This Is My Earth, you'll see that there are two, three lands that, uh, that are presented for voting. So there is one in Belize, one in Ecuador, and one in Kenya. And you can actually, after you go and donate, whether a dollar or more, you have the ability to vote for the land. And as soon as the land uh, reach the amount of money uh, that it need, needs to be purchased, we can go and purchase it. And the money is distributed among the land depending on the number of votes they uh, receive. So we also uh, we can also already show some achievements. We in the very uh, short time that we exist, we already purchased lands in the Upper Amazon in 2016 and 17. We purchased land in the, uh, off the shore of Belize. We purchased a land in uh, Colombia. Purchasing, I mean purchasing and protecting them. And now we are in the process of, uh, of uh, purchasing the land in Brazil and Kenya after the campaign of 2020. But more than that, we wanted that to bring that ability to students all over the world uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the idea that they can actually go and vote and they need to make uh, uh, um, an educated vote where they, want the, uh, where, where they want us to go and, and purchase the land. So that they gave us a very powerful tool to bring it to education, whether it's natural sciences, social sciences, uh, languages, geography, and also values like uh, democracy, equity, activism, and there's also decision-making. So all these issues go into the curriculum now. And we have curricula now from preschool to uh, university uh, levels uh, that students enjoy not only teaching, not only learning about uh, biodiversity, uh, but also acti uh, actively partic participating in purchasing and protecting the lands around the world. And it's amazing to see what the students say. They, for example, they say, I learn about myself that I can set up a goal and achieve it realize that even a 16 year old can make a difference or after I voted on Time's website, I truly felt like I changed something. So they start with PBL like learning and then they go to debating in groups and eventually they go and, and vote. So Time is about education, it's about conservation and it's about democracy. And I hope you bring it to your countries and you bring it to your friends and family and you all join and together we can do great things for the world.
Thank you. Dr. Shanus, thank you so much. It's, it's great to hear about a really practical, concrete step that every single person can take. Um, I'd love to call on Dr. Dagmar Hasse to speak next. Um, she is professor at Humboldt University in Berlin and the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Germany. Yeah, thank you very much, Uli. And also thank you very much, Uri, for this wonderful introduction. Um, I just talked today with my students about uh, land as an integrative variable in the in the biodiversity model in a landscape ecology course. So this is excellent. I should have known it before and invited you to my class. Well, thank you very much for um, just sharing my ideas with you here. And I think this is also something I, I'm always starting with when talking about preserving biodiversity um, so that it's not about preserving one or two species that are rare, that we all love and that are on all pictures we show, but it's more important to preserve ecosystems and habitats because they do better preserving species than we can do uh, as humans. And so I think this is what Uri also showed, a size land plays a big role in terms of um, preserving biodiversity. And at least the pandemic we all face now showed it that too less space for nature is a very, very dangerous thing for species, but also for species, non-human species, but also for humans. And I think we have to preserve biodiversity uh, in all parts of the world, but of course, and this is also was nicely shown on the map we saw before, there are hotspots. So, and we have to support these areas where these hotspots are. And definitely these are not the areas where most of the resources are, the financial resources. And so there must be a rethinking of how can we do this? Because I think we have excellent stewards for nature, for biodiversity in these areas. But long history of humankind made them not those who have most of the resources. This is very, very important to see this inequality. I think humans have, regardless where they are, they have the decisive role here because there are almost no untouched places in the world. And as an urban ecologist that I am, I th of course, I have to speak about cities. Cities make up only a small part in the total share of the land area, but they have a very important role in hosting more than half of the population and creating more than 90% of the GDP on the world being place of education. And of course, uh, there are recent countings of species, recent reports that tell us that cities also do quite well in collecting species so much better than open areas do. This is mainly due to intensive agriculture, we all know this, but there's also a little problem that we have a, a lot of species in cities, but we have also an accumulation of the same uh, uh, taxa. So that means we have a certain homogenization. This is a little problem and we should somehow deal with this in cities. Anyhow, I'm quite convinced that cities are good places for being pilots in a new era of biodiversity conservation because we have a lot of education. Ori showed that very well, said we can st just start in the kindergarten like and then just end up uh, in our professional life. And this is also about rising awareness. So we, we can educate in cities good stewards for nature. I accompanied a lot of projects on green blue infrastructure, on nature-based solutions in cities worldwide. And these examples showed me that this is possible to serve people with ecosystem services, with clean air, clean water, and so on. And at the same time, doing something for biodiversity. So that it's possible to create these magic co-benefits we always talk about. But of course, this needs awareness about what nature needs. This also might tell us that we should not reach a maximum of the service, but share this maximum of the service with other species, not only with humans. This is possible. So that the delivery of ecosystem services and the preservation of species is one target, not two. Well, 
we are humankind did a lot of fighting for human rights, right? So we did a long way. We are not at the end, but we did quite well in the last decades. Why not doing this for nature? Nature has also rights. And I think when we can set up sustainable development goals and human rights, we can also set up rights for nature and close the circle that already start to show, which I really liked. And I think, um, well, this could be something everybody can engage in and think about, okay, what right has this tree next to me? And how should I change possibly my behavior? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hasse. That was that was very moving, and it's it's a perfect segue um, to Yella Van Vandenberde, who I know is going to speak a little bit about uh, conserving densely populated areas. Um, Mr. Vandenberde is the advisor to the Honorable Zuhal Demir, the Flemish Minister for Justice and Enforcement, Environment, Energy, and Tourism, and he is also a lecturer at the Environmental Management and Biodiversity Program at PXL University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Belgium. Ooh, thank you. Um, so I'm a little bit of policy advisor and I'm a little bit of teacher. My students had their examination uh, today. So uh, uh, for me, the work is done um, considering that uh, for this year. So I'm happy. So I can work on policy. And uh, that's an interesting thing. Um, maybe people from, from uh, uh, the United States don't know uh, where Flanders is. Uh, we are the northern part of Belgium um, and uh, we have a regional uh, government. Um, and my minister is, is the um, environmental uh, minister in um, that beautiful region. We're a small region. Um, I was just uh, Googling um, to search for a comparison. Um, and we're a, uh, approximately as big as the state of Connecticut. So not that big. Um, um, and densely populated. We have over 6 million uh, inhabitants. Um, and that's the region where we have to work on, on biodiversity conservation. And that's very challenging. Um, on top of that, um, our region, when we go looking for the, the drought risk um, uh, ranking from the OECD, uh, we're on top of it as well. And that's an interesting thing because uh, drought risk, um, especially in a region like Flanders, where we have some big rivers actually, um, is a, a real challenge for biodiversity. What we see is that we are losing our ground uh, layer waters. Um, and because of that, uh, biodiversity is crashing in our region. Yeah, the sun is shining here. There, there was not shining all day long and now it's, uh, now it's here. Um, but um, um, for us as policymaker, it's, it's really interesting to work on that. And that's because, because of that, we, uh, we launched the, the what we're calling Blue Deal. And uh, this Blue Deal um, is a, um, a plan um, where we're trying to restore our wetlands, which is quite strange in a very populated area, um, which is... Um, uh, we, we lost our, our uh, wetlands in Flanders. We lost, in the last 60 years, we lost 50, uh, 50, uh, 75%, excuse me, from our wetlands. Um, and that makes it uh, quite challenging um, for, for biodiversity, which is dependent on these wetlands. Uh, not only birds, uh, but a lot of uh, flora uh, as well uh, is, is very uh, dependent on these wetlands. Another thing in Flanders, what we see uh, is that we lost a lot of forest. Um, we only have 9% uh, of forested area um, in Flanders, which is very low. The European uh, average is about 22% uh, for a region. Um, so that's another challenge, uh, not only uh, because of uh, um, biodiversity, but also um, climate adaptation is very important that you have enough uh, forests and enough trees in, uh, in a very populated area uh, such as ours. So my minister has a, a plan to, to um, reforest Flanders uh, by uh, 2030. We have to uh, uh, create 10,000 of hectares of extra forest and the next four years we will make 4,000 hectares, uh, which is very challenging. I heard um, uh, Professor Shainas uh, talking about the need for, for um, buying land, for preserving land for biodiversity. And that works in these areas where not a lot of people are, but we have a lot of people. People are everywhere. Um, and then it's very challenging to, to look for um, uh, areas where we can 
replant these forests where we can recreate these wetlands. Um, and then one of the most important things is money. Um, we're coming back to money uh, if we want to to um, to buy these lands. And in in these 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 areas, these biodiversity hotspots, we which were on the map, uh, Mr. Shanas was uh, showing, um, lands are not that expensive. In Flanders, land is expensive, so of course we have to look for areas where we can where we can um, preserve and buy land where they're quite cheap. Very important to preserve biodiversity. I'm supporting that fully, of course. Um, but the same thing is uh, important in in these areas where we have a lot of people and where uh, um, the grounds are quite expensive. So. Uh, money is not a problem in a very rich area. You should think uh, like Flanders were quite a rich area, um, but that's not always the case. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, for planting 4,000 uh, hectares of trees, we need approximately 150 million euros to, to create these new forests uh, throughout uh, throughout Flanders, which is quite expensive. So for us, the, the challenge is is um, quite big, um, but we really want to do that because we're we're um, quite sure that in a region with a lot of people, uh, high standards of biodiversity are really important, and that's what we're working on, and that's what I hope to discuss here uh, later on with you. So thank you. That's wonderful. And I, I love how you've raised the question of different areas needing different solutions um, and low density areas and then highly populated areas. And I would love to speak now uh, to Dr. Corinne Kleinhaus, who's going to take us away from the land altogether and towards the seas. Um, Dr. Kleinhaus is at the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University and is president of the Red Sea Reef Foundation, which supports the study and conservation of the Red Sea coral reefs. Uh, Dr. Kleinhaus, thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks so much for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, so yes, I'm shifting us from the land um, to the sea. Uh, basically, just a, what I'm working on generally is uh, in my research, I'm uh, looking at uh, aging in coral, which is super interesting because they can live for hundreds of years. And I study the coral in the Gulf of Aqaba off the Red Sea. And I'm also looking at reproduction in coral which is also super interesting, at least to me, and how um, the corals themselves use estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone in their reproduction and how that sort of reflects how we use it in ours as humans. Um, so that's on the academic side. Um, but my other role is I am president of the Red Sea Reef Foundation, uh, which is a nonprofit that works, like you said, uh, focusing on the study and the protection of the coral reefs of the Red Sea. And um, since we're speaking about biodiversity, um, the Red Sea's reefs are really a classic example of a biodiversity hotspot, an area where there's a tremendous richness of species and where they're living, uh, interacting with each other and where the ecosystem as a whole is a really rich and unique place um, that is very deserving of protection and which is very, uh, I think, neglected by the conservation community and even until very recently, the research community, um, perhaps because of its location and of the political issues that surround the region. Um, so uh, the, just to give you an idea of what an amazing place this is, um, coral reefs in general support about 25% of marine organisms at some point in their life uh, life cycle, the coral reefs are well below 1% of the area of the oceans. And the Red Sea's reefs are amazing. They have like over 360 types of coral to compare to Hawaii, which has about 80. Um, they have well over a thousand species of fish just in the coastal waters and another uh, 50 or so species living you know, in the deep, like below 200 meter depth. So there's a lot of fish and again, that's to compare to Hawaii, which is like 680 or 700 species of fish. So it's an amazing place. And what's particularly uh, important in my mind and why um, what the Red Sea Reef Foundation in part was formed for is to protect the reefs in the Northern Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba. And these are extremely valuable as a global resource because not only are they a high hotspot for biodiversity, they're also likely to be among the last reefs to survive past mid-century. 
So um, reefs are dying because the oceans are warming and because of pollution, we've lost half the Great Barrier Reef, almost all of the coral reefs around Florida, for example, but the reefs in the Northern Red Sea and in the Gulf of Aqaba have the ability to survive warming of five or six degrees centigrade still in the ocean while the rest of the reefs are pretty much at their limit. So these reefs are a global resource. They really are last stand um, for a major marine refuge from climate change. Uh, and so the Red Sea Reef Foundation is focusing on supporting research in the area. Um, we are supporting local scientific capacity. So we have awards going out to graduate students around the region, um, trying to ignore the political situation as much as possible and focus on the science and conservation. So we have um, awards going out. They'll be announced next month, this year's round um, for research on reefs. Um, we're supporting installation of high-tech coral monitoring um, that's going in now. Uh, and all that data will be open access um, for researchers to use around the world. And we're advocating strongly um, for collaboration among scientists for all the countries around the region uh, in the hopes that we can advance things um, and ignore, like I said, the political issues as much as possible because the reefs are certainly not um, paying attention to those boundaries either. Thank you, Dr. Kleinhouse. And last but certainly not least, or as the council would say, Akharon Akharon Khaviv, definitely one of our favorite guests, uh, Dr. Jill Kleitz is gonna talk um, as director of the Department of Ecological Transitions and Natural Resources at the French Development Agency. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kleitz. Thank you, Shuli, and good uh, good uh, evening and good morning and good afternoon to, to everyone. Thanks again for the, the Consulate of Israel in, in New York for this invitation. Um, I'm, I'm a, basically, I'm a, I'm a conservationist. I've worked on the, you know, on protecting lions and elephants and the Amazon forest and the French national parks as well. I'm from France and I've turned into a banker, a public banker to bring money where it is needed for conservation because I've devoted my entire life to protecting nature. And my conclusion is that um, we need to redirect the entire economy so that it becomes favorable to biodiversity. So we need to convince both public and private finance institution to make sure that the economy that we finance is positive for the planet for the climate, of course, and for biodiversity. So it's no small task, but I'm a happy man because things are moving slowly but surely. And um, in France, we are actively with uh, uh, obviously a number of, of, uh, of countries preparing for this big conference on biodiversity that's coming up uh, in, in, uh, in October, which is going to set a new framework for protecting biodiversity on earth and ensuring that when we use natural resources, we do it sustainably. So we are, for example, France together with about 70 other countries, and we started this coalition with Costa Rica. We uh, are advocating that in this new global framework, we should all decide to protect 30% of the planet under some form of protection, whether it's a form of protection like Yela was talking about sort of, uh, you know, restoring nature, whether it's about public or private land trust, like Uri was, uh, was, uh, was saying, or whether it's national parks or whether it's uh, marine protected areas or whether it's upcoming, you know, new devices to protect the high seas because it's becoming possible now with a new evolution of uh, the law on, 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 uh, on the oceans. The key question we are working on is how are we going to do that? With what money? What are we going to do with the people who live there? Because obviously, you know, it's as much a, a sort of livelihood issue as a, as a conservation issue. And, uh, and how are we going to govern this? Because this is a democracy issue as well. And it needs to be obviously inclusive and take care of, of uh, you know, all people, especially indigenous people, youth, women, uh, to be uh, completely uh, inclusive. So this is the type of, of work I do. And I, I'm, uh, I'm actually working at a, at, a, at, a, 
at a sort of public bank, which is helping and investing uh, public money um, uh, around the world, uh, trying to you know help forest conservation, ocean conservation in all its forms, basically, especially in uh, in uh, in Africa, and we are trying to work closely with you know many governments and with many uh, private and um, and uh, and uh, private banks and investors to make sure that public money and private money can progressively you know favor economic activities that are positive for biodiversity so it's not so much conservation because this is only a small part of the picture hopefully 30% in the near future but what happens with the rest of the 70% of the planet and that's where we're really concentrating on favoring you know agroecology because agriculture and food systems have the biggest impact on biodiversity so really doubly greening agriculture is absolutely key so we need to invent organic agriculture you know agriculture that restores the biodiversity of soils of landscapes of rural areas in 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 France, in Flanders, in, in Europe, you know, there are people everywhere and we need to conserve biodiversity, people and livelihoods together, otherwise it doesn't work. And it's the, pretty much the case in many, many places around the world. In other places, and maybe one third of all wild places on earth are under the custodianship of indigenous people. So their private property is not the solution. Sometimes it's even the enemy. There, it's more sort of communities and their rights who can be very powerful instruments for biodiversity conservation. And it's about recognizing their rights, for example, in the Amazon forest, but as well in the Arctic regions, and giving them the power to be really efficient power and money. The, 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 you know, the, 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 the situation to, uh, to really. Uh, keep good care of their natural environment. Um, so I won't be longer, but uh, all in all, I think we should all make uh, very strong efforts towards, uh, towards uh, preserving our planet. It's the only one we have. I think individual actions, community actions, country actions, and you know, actions all together at, at, uh, at uh, at global level are important to remind on, on this uh, International Earth Day. There's a big, big, important event coming up in October where all nations we unite to define, you know, what, what we're going to do between 2020 and 2030, but as well with a program, a horizon to 2050. So it's really like the Paris Agreement, but for biodiversity this time. And I really encourage, uh, everyone israel france europe flanders belgium and all the countries represented here uh, to uh, to really uh, push for this uh, this effort so we have a, a very ambitious uh, ambitious uh, uh, biodiversity uh, program for the coming decades all together thank you very much again for this opportunity and we'll be very happy to to uh, engage with, uh, with a lively discussion on all the subjects that we, we raised already. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Feitz. And it's, it's um, everything everyone has said is so different and so fascinating. And I'm, I'm excited to put all of you in conversation with one another. Um, and I wanna go, we've talked at sort of a macro level and I wanna bring it down to, the, to a more micro level, which is each of you have described both different problems and different solutions. You know, you're talking to a good number of people on this. And I would love to hear from each of you you know, if you could ask the people on this call or on this on this Zoom to do one thing, and whether that's a personal sustainability commitment or advocacy towards their government or pressure on the bank they're using, what would you want to see sort of an army of supporters go out and do to support this highly important work of conservation? And I'm going to open that um, open the floor to anyone who wants to answer that first. I want to answer it. It's uh, fine for me, and it, it might be a crazy idea, but put pressure on your uh, policymakers and on your government. Um, I'm working for the government, <laughs> and I am a policymaker, um, but it's really in, uh, important that we feel this pressure. Um, policymakers need 
pressure from uh, big groups of people uh, to do something. And um, for me, uh, one of the most important things is uh, uh, NGOs um, and uh, um, yeah, just regular people in the street uh, putting pressure on policymakers to preserve trees, to to be ambitious on uh, on biodiversity uh, protection. Um, and for example. Uh, because of that pressure, but not only because of that pressure, because we really want to do it, we just launched launched a, uh, launched a call uh, last week uh, to create three national parks in Flanders uh, of 10,000 hectares uh, big, so quite big on a Flanders scale. Um, so uh, that's because of this pressure. People want this, um, and because of that, we are we are uh, pushing forward. So putting pressure, please. <laughs> I would like to go next uh, and, the, and I, I, I would like to say that I, I agree that we need to put pressure on policymakers, but my feeling is that we need to, uh, to show them that the citizens have, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the citizens want to sacrifice, the citizens themselves are willing for the sacrifice, are willing to do something themselves and by showing when, when citizens show themselves that they have a personal commitment for, uh, for, for preserving biodiversity. And we give, at least time gives at least one tool that uh, people can show personal commitment. I think then it would be easier for the policymakers to say, oh, wow, the citizens are really up to that. They're really willing to put, you know, to put their, the, the hand in their pocket and so maybe we can do something also about it so so for for my my point of view is first personal commitment and and then should be followed by uh, by pressure by uh, uh, on on the policy makers yeah uh, I, I can fully agree um so uh, sorry Catherine, do you want to go first no go ahead that's okay. Um, just a very short. So, as a as a university lecturer and as a scientist, I think yeah, this is it is really important that we uh, we can recognize nature, that we can see it, and I think any commitment grows when people see nature and see also what nature is doing. So these tiny things, how nature can adapt to certain conditions, and that we take time to learn from it and then to step in in the right moment and then invest the money and then see what what happens i think very often we try to pressure nature uh, uh, to, to to press it into our timetables into our agendas and i think this is something we as university people can do to set uh, time frames that are somehow uh, yeah, adapted to what nature is doing. And on the other hand, I fully agree with, with the two other participants of the panel that, uh, yeah, we have to dedicate more, also more time and power, personal power uh, as experts to that local level. Um, just to add to that, uh, at least in the States, we can see now the effect of voting um, along climate uh, agenda lines. So, um, the President Biden is going to be announcing a big um, climate initiative. I think it's today or tomorrow with drastic changes, at least what he plans to do. Um, and I think that we need to vote you know, locally and nationally and at the UN and in every other forum, you know, using climate change and biodiversity protection as a sort of uh, yardstick for, for who we're voting for and let everybody know. So, you know, that just dovetails with the pressure on policymakers that this has to be a priority for us. Um, and the other thing I think was touched on, um, but you really, uh, as NGOs or as um, educators, we need to engage with um, local populations uh, with perhaps different priorities than we have and be realistic about um, what they are going to do to protect their own um, areas. So I am always thinking about, you know, reefs and reefs tend to be offshore, right on shore or right offshore. And um, many of them are in um, regions with poor economic uh, resources. And you have to find a way to engage people and have them see the benefits to themselves 
of protecting things like reefs, uh, things like improving fishing, uh, you know, reduce, improving income from tourism, uh, reducing pollution, uh, and all these other things. And you, if you don't engage the people who are really responsible for their local resources, you're going to lose in the long run, I think. So to add to that great list, maybe participants didn't think they were going to go home with a long list of homeworks. One more, choose very carefully what you consume, put pressure on corporates. You know, I think we really have to reflect on our ecological footprints. And, and you know, it does matter whether you uh, buy a, a local vegetable or a vegetable from the other side of the planet whether you buy a certified wood product or you know, a wood you don't know where it comes from and it might actually be destroying a forest somewhere on the planet. So, you know, voting, joining a local NGO, making care of, of your nature just around you, um, voting right and choosing carefully what you consume, that's already, if you can tick all these boxes, <laughs> I do, I do have a contribution, if I could jump in. I am a professor of urban planning. I'm a professor of urban planning at the University of California, Berkeley. As an urban planner, the way that we organize structure cities is really how we organize and structure a lot of our human activity. I'd like to give you a framework that illustrates how urban transformation can actually be one of the contributions for social and planetary transformation. And this is highlighted in my book that I actually developed on issues of human rights of persons with disabilities. But it's interesting to see how it applies to climate change. Okay. It has five very simple ways of analysis. Okay. Benchmark first is about laws and leaderships. No, thank you so much. I would love if you would put the name of your book in the chat because that does sound extremely on point for most of our audience. And I think we would love to, to have the opportunity to read it. And thank you. I couldn't agree more that um, urban areas are actually key, um, key to so much of what we're doing. Um, and actually, this is a great opportunity. If people do have questions or contributions, uh, we only have time for a couple more. So I'm going to open up the chat. And if you could um, both give comments, input, and questions over chat. That would be wonderful. Um, while people are putting those in the chat, I'm gonna take a question that we got on the Facebook page where this is live streaming, which is basically a question about carbon emissions. And we know carbon emissions are so responsible for a lot of the devastation we're seeing that's affecting biodiversity. Um, and just if one or two or three panelists wanna say a word or two about that. Maybe I, I, I can answer that. I mean, I think, Biodiversity conservation and conserving ecosystems in a healthy way is absolutely, you know, um, part of the solution to the climate crisis. This is why, for example, in France, we have decided that all our foreign uh, climate efforts, money, one third of it should be directly positive for biodiversity. This is what we call nature-based solutions for climate. So I think it's very important to, to push for all government, our governments basically to ensure that all climate solutions, what is called, you know, or nationally uh, um, uh, um, determined contribution to the climate and to the Paris Agreement include a big part of biodiversity, maybe one third at least, because more than half of the human emissions of greenhouse gas emissions are actually captured by healthy ecosystems. If you lose LC oceans or forests, we lose that capacity. So it really works together, climate and biodiversity. It's one and the same planet and environment issue really. If I may add uh, just the numbers, uh, so we calculated, for example, in our organization that every dollar that is donated to time actually helps to keep 175 
kilogram of carbon uh, in the ground. So it's just amazing how much each one of us can do. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's, uh, you, you're right, I agree. It's, it's first, it's the nature-based uh, solutions that we have to, to tackle, but of course there's also other things to do. I might, I might add something uh, to that. Uh, in Europe, we have this uh, LULUCF, uh, as we call it. That's uh, the land use, land change, and forestry rule, where there we have uh, um, a European legislation that states that we cannot um, uh, have uh, CO2 um, emitting from uh, change in land use and uh, change in forestry. Um, and because of that, that's why we are um, creating and restoring more forests and protecting our forests that we have even in a small region and a highly populated region uh, as uh, Flanders is. And restoration of wetlands is really important because people think that um, forests are important and of course forests are important, but uh, uh, wetlands uh, capture a lot of carbon uh, from, uh, from the air. Um, and when, you, uh, when these wetlands dry, um, they emit a lot of, uh, of carbon into the, the atmosphere and that's what we want to prevent. So that's a really important uh, issue as well, even in these uh, highly uh, dense uh, populated, populated areas. Yeah, I can I can only support this argument. I always saying the most important issue that we have, will face in the next future is water. We see it coming and it's already there. And I think we can just grab carbon and water and a kind of sponge, right? So when we increase the sponge properties of all our landscapes, regardless where they are, then we can also keep species there. And I think this is important, but keep it and keep also time for that. And I can just say again, um, planting a tree is wonderful, but a tree is part of an ecosystem of a forest. And I think nature can anyhow better do and preserve all what is connected to a tree, all the species, when we give it time to grow. At the moment in Germany, so many trees are dying and it looks horrible in our uh, middle range mountains. But actually it is good because they were planted, they don't belong to the ecosystem as such. And now we have the unique chance for a lot of mountains that they regrow. And I really hope that our foresters keep the dead wood there. <laughs> um, Dr. Hasse, that was, that was beautiful. And I think, um, you know, talking about an ecosystem and how it as a whole contributes to biodiversity feels like the perfect metaphor for what we're hearing on this call, which is it's also an ecosystem of action that's gonna make a difference here it's individual commitments, it's education, it's working with our governments and our NGOs and corporations and banks. Um, and so with that, I think I'm gonna give an opportunity for every single one of our panelists to just speak for one additional minute for anything they'd wanna leave um, this wonderful group or wonderful audience with uh, before we close. Um, I'm gonna go in the same order we started with. So starting with um, Professor Shainis, if you wanna um, give some closing yeah. remarks. Okay. Uh yeah, I would like just would like to add that uh, I can't remember who said it was it Gilles or uh, one of the panelists said about the indigenous people and I so much agree and uh, for example with time one of our pillars is to keep the land with the indigenous people with the local people so when we purchase a land we do not purchase it for time or for anybody else uh, in the western world we 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 give the land to the local people and they keep it and, and they preserve it. And we believe that they do the best way in the, they keep the land in the best way uh, uh, to, for future generations. Thank you, Dr. Shannis. And you should know, you actually just responded to a question you didn't know existed that came through on Facebook about our uh, about okay. uh, <laughs> relationships with indigenous okay. people. So you did a wonderful job and thank you to whoever on Facebook posted that question for us. Um, Dr. Hasse. Yeah, I just want to come back in my last sentence on, on what Victor uh, brought in, because I think it's really important. I'm often collaborating with social scientists and they tell me every time, think about justice, Think about justice, think about fairness. This is one key that people get involved in because this is not a, an issue of unwillingness. It's very often an issue of uh, non being able or capable to. And this is, this is really important. And I wish to spread this idea. Thank you also, Victor, for that bringing in.
Victor, uh, Miriam, take note of his name for your next panel. Um, Yela, what, what would you like to share? I would like to share as a closing argument. First of all, thank you for uh, for having me and uh, as a representative of my minister. Um, but start at your home, um, uh, start in your garden. Uh, sometimes it's quite simple to to uh, restore biodiversity, to help biodiversity. Don't use pesticides, um, uh, stuff like that. Uh, it can be quite small, uh, but you can have a quite a, a, an achievement in your garden with a lot of butterflies and stuff like that, uh, just because you um, you don't use these stuffs. So that's for me a quite important message. Start small, start in your garden. I cannot agree more. Um, Dr. Kleinow. Uh, well, sort of springboarding off that, I would say the toolkits already exist for us to protect biodiversity, which we've heard already from everybody here. Um, the toolkits exist for marine biodiversity and for land biodiversity. We just need to find a way to use them. Um, the same way we can stop uh, climate change from worsening. We have the technology already. We know what we need to do. Uh, we just need to get on it. So thank you very much for uh, giving us a forum to talk about all of these issues here. Amen. And finally, Dr. Kleitz. Thank you. There is a big uh, ray of sun coming in, so maybe that's the sign of the, the end. What I'd say is that there is a there is urgency to act. So do you know? Do commit to acting now uh, because there is an urgency. And as well as uh, Karine said, there is a question of time, like corals. You know, biodiversity is long term as well. And long term for humans is about, you know, how we convince our kids. So if you have kids, if you're professors, teachers, just bring your kids to, you know, natural, beautiful places, convince them that this is the future. That's what I would say. Thank you. I think that's beautiful. And it's true, the human life is very short in the context of the world, the generations that we hope to see come after us are very, very long. Um, and I know I'm taking that with me for my own children and, and for all of humanity. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. Thank you to the Israeli consulate for hosting us. And thank you to all for joining us today. Thank you from the Israeli Thanks. consulate Bye -bye. to our panelists and to thank our phenomenal you. moderator. And if you would like to join us later today, this is a part of a global forum. You can find in the chat box more opportunities that are happening today discussing super important issues. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day, night, and afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.